Okay. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to sort of be here and, you know, it's always lovely to be here at ICTS. It was a very relaxing environment in some sense and to escape from the Chennai heat. So what I'm going to talk about is basically, you know, the, uh, the, what is so sort of magical or fascinating about the pyroclo architecture, which Arunab already uh, showed you, as one of the most, uh, it in some sense, characterizes is, is, is the epitome of geometric frustration. Uh, and it's sort of uh, the architecture that frustrated the magnetism people have been looking at for a while. And uh, well, my talk is going to be about sort of what kind of novel phases in matter, so exotic zero temperature quantum phases that can arise in frustrated magnets in general, in particular focusing on the pyroclo architecture. So let's start. So first I'll set up the problem. I'll try to motivate uh, the, the, the fascinating thing about frustrated magnets. Uh, then I'll go on to uh, sort of give you a classical picture so as to get an intuitive idea of what I'm going to sort of, you know, uh, talk about. And then I'm going to present to you the, the main part of the talk, which is actually describing the pseudo-fermion functional RG method, which is one of the powerful non-perturbative schemes for taking into account the effects of quantum fluctuations, uh, which remains for, uh, for you know, people in, for working in frustrated magnets, one of the most uh, sort of challenging uh, things to sort of capture. Uh, and then as an application of the FRG method, I'm going to apply to two candidate spin liquid materials that have recently appeared in the scene. Uh, one based on the pyroclo geometry and the other on the hypercargome. And then I'm going to sort of conclude what is this. So let's start many steps back. So if you've read this book by Anderson, Concepts in Solids, it asks a very nice question on the first page, which is why is the ground state of almost all assemblages of atoms regular rather than irregular in nature? And uh, he says that there are many theoretical suggestions, but no proof or any convincing arguments. Uh, indeed, if you look at it from an ab initio point of view and look at the H electron plus nucleus, this is generally invariant under the full continuous space translation and rotation group. Now, Landau has expressed this point of view, that it is unreasonable to expect a system with a fully symmetric Hamiltonian to have a lowest energy state with no symmetry at all. Now, this is, a, as Anderson says, an interesting point of view, but hardly a convincing argument. Right? So generally what happens in most cases is that the system condenses, that it gets stuck somewhere in between. Neither does, it, uh, neither does the ground state preserve the full symmetry of the parent Hamiltonian, nor does, it break, uh, nor does it break all the symmetries and go into an irregular state where the symmetry group is just the identity. Uh, it chooses some sort of a periodic space group and that is what characterizes crystalline solids. Indeed, actually it's quite rare to find systems in which the ground state preserves the full a symmetry of the parent Hamiltonian, and it could be only that at helium-4 at low pressure and possibly helium-3 that the ground state actually preserves the full symmetry of the parent Hamiltonian. So the question then arises, why are there not more instances of quantum liquids? So this actually leads us to the question, what would be the key ingredients that one would need to put into a system so as to prevent or escape symmetry breaking at low temperatures? So let's look at a cartoon picture of an antiferromagnet. Cartoon, I mean, because, uh, of course, the antiferromagnetic state is not an eigenstate of the exchange Hamiltonian. And if you put it on, say, a simple cubic lattice here, just shown for, for you know, reasons of presentation, you will see that the ground state is a simple, you know, this uh, two sublattice uh, nail state, and the low energy excitations disperse linearly with k. Uh, the frequency goes linearly with k at small k. Now, when you're, this is, of course, a good picture when you're in a very large spin limit, and there, I mean, if you want to take into account the corrections due to quantum mechanics, then the harmonic spin wave theory would tell you that the correction to the sublattice magnetization S uh, where is given by this expression where Z is the coordination number, J is the antiferromagnetic exchange coupling, S is the sublattice magnetization, and this N of K simply is the uh, uh, factor which takes into account the number of thermally excited spin waves. Now from this expression, when integrated over the entire Brillouin zone, you see that the fluctuations increase with temperature, and the sublattice magnetization must go to zero at some particular temperature, which, give, which is given by the nail temperature. And in mean field theory, we all know that it is given by this expression. Now, the thing is that if you want to evade nail order, or in other words, if you want to suppress T nail to zero, uh, what you need is basically, uh, uh, as you can see from this expression, uh, that the excitation, so, so if there is a tendency in the system to have many low frequency modes, right? And if these low frequency modes can get all populated at very low temperatures, then these excitations will be effective in reducing the moment, and which is mathematically captured by this part of the expression that you saw. And the thing is that the manifest characteristic of frustrated magnets is the fact that you have a large number of low frequency modes which are thermally populated at low temperatures. And this is effective in actually killing the T nail and trying to suppress it either to many orders of magnitude smaller than the leading exchange coupling, 
or in the ideal case, suppressing it to zero, in which case you get the ideal what one calls as a quantum spin liquid. Right, so uh, the prototypical example that people study is that of a parametrically frustrated square lattice where you have a nearest neighbor interaction which is antiferromagnetic, and then there's a competing interaction which is across the diagonals, which is the, the antiferromagnetic J2 interaction. And one can clearly see that when J2 over J1 is less than one half, the system is in a standard two sublattice nail state, whereas when J2 over J1 is greater than one half, you have nail order in the second neighbor bonds, but then that frustrates the one in the nearest neighbor bonds. And there's a special point uh, at which uh, there is a high degeneracy, by which I mean that if you write the Heisenberg Hamiltonian and take the Fourier transform of that, the J of Q actually is a minima, not at an isolated Q vector, but at a full manifold which consists of a square of, that is basically on a manifold of co-dimension one. And these two states then become classically de degenerate and the effects of frustration are the largest at this point. So this is the standard example that people take of parametric frustration. And another classic example that was first studied by Anderson and which actually formed the basis of the res resonating valence bond paradigm uh, is for the example of the triangular lattice Heisenberg antiferromagnet, a system in which he conjectured the structure alone or, or the constraints put in the geometry alone uh, could actually destabilize nail order. And indeed, uh, if you take a classical Heisenberg antiferromagnet, then the ground states are simply configurations in which the spins on each triangle add up, vectorially add up to basically zero and are at, are at, are at 120 degrees with respect to each other. Now, the, another characteristic that shows up in frustration is the fact that without any underlying symmetry, you generally have an accidental degeneracy that is present in the system. So, For example, if you, if you take such a system of two triangles, then you can clearly see that you can rotate uh, the, second, the plane of the spins of the second triangle about this common axis and nothing changes. The ground state manifold remains the same. The states are simply those in which the spins are at 120 degrees with respect to each other. So this corner sharing arrangement, as Arnav showed, is actually one way that if you have an individual frustrated motif, suppose you have a triangle or if you have a tetrahedron, then if you start joining them, there are two ways of joining them and making a cluster in the thermodynamic limit. One is actually start connecting them by their vertices. If you do that, uh, either on the, uh, for the triangles or for the tetrahedra, you only alleviate the frustration marginally. Where if you start joining them by their edges, uh, you alleviate frustration much stronger, and this is clearly seen that if you actually take the triangle and start joining there by the edges, you get a triangular lattice, which, for example, for spin one half is magnetically ordered, and the same if you do it with a tetrahedra, you get an FCC lattice, which is also possibly magnetically ordered. Whereas if you start joining them by their vertices, then actually this does not arise, and these two systems then represent one of the most geometrically frustrated magnets. Indeed, one way to see that there's an extensive ground state degeneracy in these systems is the fact that if you take the simple Heisenberg Hamiltonian, you can rewrite it in terms of the magnetization uh, over each of these individual motifs, where this is just simply this vector sum of the spins. If you open it up, you get the cross terms minus a constant. So, and the ground state is simply those, and any state which satisfies this constraint that m of t is identically zero over uh, all the individual motifs. And as you can see trivially from this, that there's not one state, but there'll be an infinite number of states which can satisfy this constraint. So um, this is as far as the theoretical sort of picture is concerned. If you look at in experiments, then the single most revealing property of geometrical, geometrically frustrated magnets is captured by the susceptibility, the magnetic susceptibility. And indeed, it shows up in the fact that, that in an unfrustrated system, there'll be onset of magnetic order at a temperature which is typically given by the, by the interaction energy scale in the system, and there'll be a cusp in the susceptibility uh, at the nail temperature. In geometrically frustrated magnets, nothing sharp would be observe, observed at that temperature scale, set by the interaction strength, and the paramagnetic state would extend to temperatures much smaller than the Curie-Weiss temperature. Uh, and indeed, the frustration ratio, which is the ratio of the Curie-Weiss temperature, the modulus of this to the ordering temperature, tells you the degree of frustration in a magnet, and this is what uh, experimentalists typically use uh, as a working definition of frustration. Uh, if similarly, if you do uh, neutron scattering, uh, then the dynamical structure factor would show you no sharp uh, peaks at any finite wave vector Q, uh, and, and, and basically, the, there'll be a very small value of the elastic uh, scattering cross-section. Okay, whereas in, if you take an unfrustrated antiferromagnet or a ferromagnet, uh, the nail and the ferromagnetic order would lead to very sharp Bragg peaks. So the question then arises that why is there no magnetic ordering at a temperature set by the, say, the Curie-Weiss temperature? 
And if so, uh, what is the nature of correlations in this cooperative paramagnetic regime or the strongly interacting regime uh, that is much below the Curie Weiss temperature but still above, say, the ordering temperature? So there's a simple counting exercise you can do to convince yourself of this fact. So if you take a single tetrahedral cluster of four spins, and I said the Hamiltonian can always be rewritten in terms of the total magnetization in this, then you can clearly see that there are two internal degrees of freedom about which, you know, two angles you can play with, which does not destroy this constraint, right? Uh, and telling you that there is basically the system's ground state manifold is characterized by this two-dimensional degeneracy uh, by these polar and the azimuthal angles. And this degeneracy extends from a single cluster to a periodic lattice. Let's see how it does it. So suppose you take a classical Heisenberg spin, which has, so, so by Heisenberg it has three components and there's one constraint. So the total number of degrees of freedom will be two times the number of spins, right? Written in terms of number of clusters, it'll be four times NC because each spin is shared by two different, uh, two clusters, right? Now the ground state, for, for any state to be called a ground state, the constraint is basically that the sum of the spins should be identically zero. So component by component, the x, y, and z components should sum up to zero, and therefore you have three, three times nc constraints, where nc is the number of tetrahedra. So if you do a simple counting argument of the degrees of freedom, you see the number of degrees of freedom minus the constraints basically gives you a number which is equal to the number of tetrahedra. Now this is an extensive quantity, and it's indeed a remarkable result. It tells you that there exist local degrees of freedom uh, which can fluctuate, you know, independently without the system leaving its ground state. In other words, there are no internal energy barriers in a system. So the pyrochlor lattice is special in this sense that the number of degrees of freedom is basically after the system is under constraint in other sense, in, in this sense, and the number of degrees of freedom basically scales with the number of uh, clusters that you have in the, in the system. And this is indeed uh, something that is unique to the pyrochlor lattice because you can do a general counting argument for classical n component spins located in the vertices of a Q site cluster. And if you do it, you see that it's only for n is equal to 3 and Q equals 4 that you get this result that the number of degrees of freedom is basically equal to the number of, of clusters. Right here. So indeed, I mean, uh, that is the reason why people got interested in frustrated magnets. And in the 90s, there was a lot of work on classical Heisenberg antiferromagnets and the pyrochlor lattice, which Arunab talked about. And it turns out that uh, in this model, uh, this model basically fails to develop any magnetic long range order down to zero temperature. And this is the consequence, as I talked about, of this extensive classical degeneracy, which is exponential order Q. Indeed, this degeneracy, as I said, is so severe the thermal order by disorder mechanism is unable to lift it and elect any unique ground state pattern. And it forms what Villon called as a cooperative paramagnetic state. And this is the fate not just of Heisenberg magnets, but indeed all classical ON antiferromagnets, nearest neighbor, on the pyrochlor lattice fail to develop dipolar long range order down to zero temperature, okay, except for two component spins, which order collinearly. Besides this, all other systems, uh, all other sort of, for any value of n, the system fails to select that. So uh, as Arnab showed, actually, at zero temperature, this classical spin liquid features algebraic correlations, so they're dipolar in nature. And when you Fourier transform them, uh, and you look at it, the HHL plane, which is the plane in which kx equals ky in momentum space, you get these beautiful bow tie patterns with these pinch points right in the center here these points, which are basically just another way of saying that the ground state manifold is characterized by the, by the zero divergence rule, other than the fact that the sum of the spins is identically zero. In Fourier space, this just manifests in algebraic correlations, which when Fourier transform gives you bow ties. So these bow ties are simply just a manifestation of, 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 of this thing. Now, when you come to finite temperature, thermal fluctuations will of course cause a violation of this constraint and they will generate a finite correlation length beyond which the system's correlations will decay exponentially. And the bow ties will acquire a finite width which will go as square root of t, uh, as you can see here. And then um, uh, the non-analyticity in the structure factor at the pinch point will disappear and the bow tie and the pinch points will become smoothened and softened in, in, uh, uh, as you can see uh, in this. So the next question that arises is, what is the impact of quantum fluctuations on this problem? So this was all classical. So this problem was, uh, was tackled by Chris Henley a long time ago and in, in a series of papers uh, where he did this effective Hamiltonian approach and tried to do a harmonic order in spin wave theory and also go to quartic order in the boson operators. And what he found was that to harmonic order in 1 over s, the degeneracy is only partly lifted. That is, the degeneracy becomes from extensive to sub-extensive among the system a set of collinear states. If you add higher order terms, which are quartic corrections in the boson operators, 
Uh, this breaks the degeneracy of the harmonic ground states, but there still remains a family of almost degenerate states which are still subextensive, and they are still infinite in number. And so the fate of the semi-classical approach remains unsettled. This is one of the critically outstanding problems in quantum magnetism. What is the ground state of a large S antiferromagnet on the pyrochloral lattice? Uh, in the small S limit, people have tried perturbative approaches, by which I mean they sort of decouple the system into you know, independent tetrahedra, say up tetrahedra, and start reconnecting them back in perturbation theory. But these approaches inherently involve symmetry breaking, and it's not a surprise that many of them have predicted valence bond crystal ground states. There are other flavors of perturbative uh, expansions by Benjamin Carnals and Lacroix and, uh, and the variational Monte Carlo approaches, which claim for a quantum spin liquid behavior. But nonetheless, none of these are exhaustive in the sense people have tried some few variational wave functions uh, and have tried to argue, you know, uh, based on energetics, which one is uh, sort of good. So both the largest and the smallest limit in the pyrochlor remains an open problem. Uh, uh, about the one regarding the selection by quantum fluctuations and the other is actually melting of whatever order possibly if there could be and then what kind of a state it realizes. So it is in this context that I will introduce the pseudo fermion functional RG method, uh, which is basically a new method, a sort of new kid in the block, uh, which, which uh, is one of the non-perturbative schemes uh, which allows you to capture the effects of quantum fluctuations uh, without assuming a mean field, mean field is sort of picture, which I'll explain. So, the, so we, attack, we are sort of confronted by the following problem. You have a spin Hamiltonian, uh, typically, let's say, starting with involving two spin operators, need not be diagonal in any way, so it could be a general 3 by 3 matrix. And the thing is that, how do you now uh, sort of solve for this? So one approach is that you rewrite the spins in terms of uh, SU2 Abrikos or fermion uh, operators, and you land up with an even more complicated Hamiltonian, which is the four fermion Hamiltonian given here. Now, the traditional approach, which... Uh, uh, which people would take uh, to try to get some insight into the thing would be to do a mean field decoupling. That is, decouple this four fermion interaction into a hopping and a pairing channel and the standard spin mean field, right? So the spin mean field would capture the magnetic order and the spin liquid of the RVB states would be characterized by the, uh, by the sign structures or the different, you know, uh, ansatzer that could be generated from the pairing and the hopping terms. Now, the FRG is a much more bolder attempt. It tries not to go to a mean fieldish picture, but treat the fermion Hamiltonian in its full complexity. So what I'm not going to do, uh, I will not decouple this Hamiltonian, but rather try to tackle this full four fermion interaction. Now, the trouble here is that this is a very peculiar Hamiltonian. There's no kinetic term here, right? So there's no natural perturbative starting point in the expansion. So the aim is to do diagrammatics in the fermions. Uh, and this is FRG formulated in Matsubara frequency and in real space. So the propagator is simply 1 over i omega. It's strictly local. There is no self-energy term right at the beginning at, at higher lambdas, simply because there is no kinetic term in the Hamiltonian. And the interaction vertex is simply given by the interaction uh, strength. Now, since there is no small parameter in this problem, you cannot do, say, a summation up to fifth order or to tenth order to restrict yourself to any finite order but rather you must find a way to do self-consistent infinite order diagrammatic summations, right? And the FRG is simply an efficient way to carry about, to go on doing this business, right? So what it does is that it introduces an infrared frequency cutoff in the propagator, okay? So you introduce this theta function, which kills all modes below a certain uh, lambda, right? And then you start with very large lambda, and then you start to reconstruct the full Hamiltonian and take into account systematically by integrating out the high energy modes, you try to recover the original Hamiltonian in the problem. The trouble there is that all vertex functions then become lambda dependent. So you have the self energy, the two particle vertex, the three particle vertex and so on. And the FRG will basically formulate differential equations for all these m particle vertex functions, right? Now the thing is that you can do and carry out an expansion in the couplings for the self energy. And then you take the derivative with respect to lambda, you get the single scale propagators, and the right hand side can be straightforwardly resummed, and you get the flow equation for the self energy. So the flow equation for the self energy is couples to itself and the two particle vertex. Similar scheme you can carry out for the two particle vertex, right, and resum the right hand side, and you land up with a flow equation which couples to the self energy, the two particle vertex, and the three particle vertex, right? And so on and so forth. So you can formulate this as hierarchy of infinite number of differential equations for all the m particle vertex functions. And the miraculous thing is that this is an exact mapping. It's an exact as Polchinski showed, right? This is exact. So this is already quite a remarkable result. 
The only trouble is that you cannot solve this infinite hierarchy of equations unless you do some sort of a truncation scheme. So uh, let's look at the structure of the equations. So in the FRG equation, say for the two particle vertex, you see that the first two terms are the ladder diagrams, the particle particle ladder and the particle hole ladder. This is the ter term here is the standard RPA diagrams, right? And then you have the vertex corrections between them. So that's why if you have divergences in one channel, they'll be regularized by the other one. So this is more advanced than standard renormalized perturbation theory that one would do, right? So for example, if you delete all terms in the equation and keep only, at the, only the bubble diagrams, the RPA channel, and solve for the equations, you'll recover the standard spin mean field theory of Ashcroft and Merman, right? If you delete this diagram and keep only the ladder diagrams, you'll recover the standard large n theory of Reed and Sajdev, okay? So the, what the FRG does is try to take into account the ordering tendencies and the disordering tendencies on an equal footing, okay? So the, the, the basic thing idea is then to solve the system of equations under a certain approximation. So what we do is to discard the three particle vertex, not completely, but Katanen actually gave us a scheme of how to preserve the ward identities or the conservation laws much better. So we take into account the self-energy corrections which are completely fed back into the equations. So when you truncate it, it's actually a, a sort of a closed sort of system of equation that you form in the sense that the self-energy is completely fed back into the, uh, in, into, the, into, the, into the truncated system of equations. So the flow typically starts at lambda, very large values, right? And then you have to solve this set of coupled differential equations, which is around 10 to the power 7 coupled differential equations. And the good thing is that you can, by exploiting all the symmetries of the flow equations and the, and the lattices and everything, you can reach up to very large system sizes. So the typical correlation lengths in 3D you can reach, for example, would be 10 to 15 lattice spacings, which even methods in 2D don't find it easy. And then you can solve the equations with the full frequency dependencies of the vertex functions. Right? So that, and the reason why we cannot go beyond the two particle vertex is simply a computational problem. The three particle vertex would be a function of five frequencies and the memory requirements would simply go out of, uh, out of hand. And the thing that we are computing is basically the static susceptibility. So we compute the, the dynamical structure factor at zero frequency as of now. So the work is in progress to actually get the full dynamics into picture, but this requires actually uh, the Keldish formulation, which we are working on, uh, in which you can recast the whole FRG framework and pseudo fermions, not in terms of Matsubara frequency, but on the real frequency axis, and therefore avoid the whole analytical continuation problem, uh, which, which gives you so much trouble. So as I said, the FRG sums up diagrammatic contributions in infinite order in J, uh, and as I already mentioned, the diagrams physically correspond to this. So you have the particle-particle ladder. Uh, uh, so the batteries run out. So if you have any other thing, otherwise it's fine. So yeah, so you have the particle-particle ladder, which takes into account the superconducting channel, C dagger, C dagger. And then you have the particle hole ladder, which is the, simply the, the, the hopping that you do in standard mean field theory, and the bubble diagrams. And they basically, the RPA graphs correspond to uh, magnetic order, whereas the ladder graphs are the, simply the dimer states uh, that are there. So, yeah, so this, uh, this uh, FRG that is formulated for SU2, uh, you know, if you, if, you, if you generalize it, consider it in a general framework of SUN representation for a spin S, then the ladder diagrams physically uh, are, are, should I see? So the ladder diagrams are simply the leading contributions in a one over N expansion. And what I neglect by throwing out the three particle vertex are simply the sub-leading contributions in one over n, right? So, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, the RPA diagrams, uh, otherwise, are just simply the leading contributions in a one over s, uh, and, and when I throw the three particle vertex, the sub-leading contributions are basically kicked out. So the FRG is exact separately in two limits. In the large s limit, it exactly reproduces the results to leading order in one over s that the spin mean field theory would do. And in the, in the large n limit, it separately reproduces the standard large n mean field theory, and it sums up diagrams to leading order in 1 over n exactly, okay? So the great thing is that ordering and disordering tendencies are equally included in a one-loop FRG. Uh, if you could go to two-loop, three-loop, which, uh, which we have already done, uh, then uh, you see basically that this just means inserting diagrams into each other. And if you do a sort of a study of loop convergence, then if you could go to, you know, sum up to all order, then that reproduces the parquet approximation. Uh, but, okay. So, how can I move? Okay, sorry.
know. <laughs> yeah, good. So, uh, uh, since we are working with pseudofermions, already the question would have arisen in your minds, what happens about this constraint, about the artificial enlargement of the Hilbert space? So, what you can do is to, to, to go back to the physically, uh, you know, Hilbert space of the Heisenberg model, is to enforce this constraint via the popo fedotov method, uh, which is basically just a smart way of, uh, of cancelling out the, the contributions in the, in the partition sum of the unphysical state by just introducing an imaginary chemical potential at every side. The other more cheaper way is simply to introduce level repulsion terms, uh, which, bakes, which, uh, which basically lowers the energy of the physical states and, you know, so that the unphysical states are pushed up in energy. And the, the average fulfillment uh, that you can impose is simply by putting a chemical potential equal to zero. Uh, but actually, if you compare the results, so on a square lattice, if you look at the susceptibility versus temperature, uh, the red curve is for the average constraint, uh, and the blue curve is for the exact implementation of the ferrotov popov method. At small temperatures, they start coinciding with each other. However, the problem is that the ferrotov popov is numerically a little more expensive, so typically we work with the average implementation of the constraints, uh, which will work at sufficiently low temperatures because there's an energy cost to create a fermion fluctuation, right? Uh, the FRG approach is no longer, not only restricted to spin one half, but can straightforwardly be generalized to arbitrary spin S. Uh, you just introduce M copies of spin one half on each side and add level repulsion terms, which says that you select the largest contribution in the angular momentum. Uh, so that just involves the fact that, that, that you introduce uh, in the fermionic representation clear fermion, fermion flavors uh, and then you just have to be careful in which term in the RG equations you have to introduce factors of 2s. Uh, so, has, so the simple thing is that every time you encounter a fermion loop, you just add a 2s prefactor. So the flow equations just get modified by these factors of m floating around here. And clearly you see that when m goes to infinity or spin length goes to infinity, you are simply left with the RPA diagrams, right? So this term strengthens the RPA channel or rather the magnetic ordering tendencies as it should be, right? Uh, and then it reproduces a, a, a standard classical result to wherever you, you want it. So, uh, for example, to benchmark, you can apply the FRG on the simple cubic lattice, Heisenberg antiferromagnet. So here I present in the generalized phase diagram of J1, J2, J3, but for, for sort of comparison, it's sufficient to look at the nearest neighbor model here, uh, where uh, the nail temperature the FRG can calculate. So the thing is that you look at the static susceptibility as a function of lambda, uh, and then in the flow, whenever you encounter a magnetically ordered state, you have a tendency towards divergence at some finite lambda or finite temperature. Of course, in a, in a system with only a finite number of spins, the Fourier transform can never diverge. So you don't have a real divergence, but you see that there's a breakdown in the RG flow in the sense that when the correlations reach the box volume, uh, the, the, the vertex functions start depending sensitively on the frequency, and you have large oscillations in the flow, and there's a non-monotonic non behavior, and the flow in some sense breaks down. But as you keep increasing the system size, this will develop into a divergence. And this then gives you an estimate of what the transition temperature is because the RG cutoff simply acts like a, like a temperature. So there's a prefactor connecting the two, it's pi half, for example, for spin one half. And in the case of a paramagnetic flow, the system remains, uh, the RG flow remains smooth down to zero temperature. So this way you can distinguish ordered and disordered states. And that way, if you calculate the nail temperature for the simple cubic antiferromagnet spin one half, uh, then the Q, exact QMC result is given by this black dot here, and the FRG result comes within one error bar of that result. So the, 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 this is due to Anders Sandvik's paper from late 90s. Never mind about the other results. So what I'm going to present to you uh, briefly are the results that appeared in a recent work of ours in PRX on the quantum and classical phases of the Pyroclo-Heisenberg model, where we showed that there is a large regime of spin liquid behavior in the Heisenberg antiferromagnet on the Pyroclo lattice, even in the presence of longer range couplings. So uh, if you look at the spin one half nearest neighbor antiferromagnet, the RG flow does not show any sign of a divergence at any finite temperature and remains smooth down to zero temperature. Uh, and this happens not just for some high symmetry points in the Brillouin zone, but the entire Brillouin zone. Remember classically, if you take the Fourier transform, the exchange matrix, that has a minima in the entire Brillouin zone. It's a degenerate state, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a highly degenerate state. And what we show is that at spin one half, quantum fluctuations do not lift this degeneracy. And the system remains in sort of a Coulomb spin liquid, and you get this, uh, this approximate bow tie pattern with, with smoothened pinch points, right? Because the constraint in a quantum model can never be satisfied that the magnetization is zero. Uh, 
because the magnetization operator does not commute with the, the total spin operator does not commute with the Hamiltonian. So you have bow ties which are sort of, you know, and pinch points which are, which are smoothened. The great thing about FRG is that you can reach temperatures which are much smaller than the exchange uh, coupling, so about two orders of magnitude smaller. Uh, whereas this, there, there is another approach, you can do also bold diagrammatic QMC and compute the same quantity. This was done by Prokofiev's group. Uh, but the only restriction they have is that the convergence of the Feynman, the, the skeleton series actually becomes very poor below a temperature which is roughly J over 6. So you cannot completely rule out magnetic order if you restrict yourself to temperatures which are just J over 6, whereas in RG you can go to J over 100 easily, right? So, so, so one of the results is that the ground state we found was, was sort of non-magnetic. To rule out whether it's, it, uh, it could break translational symmetry or it's not a valence bond crystal, what you can do is to compute dimer functions, response functions. So you introduce some sort of symmetry breaking with different patterns uh, and then compute the response function under the RG flow. And what we found is that uh, we tried with some simple VBC patterns and the system under the RG flow always sort of the response function dies out. So the system sort of, uh, you know, uh, is not responding to, to, to symmetry breaking which is present and trying to reject it. Uh, you could also, we also looked into the effects of breathing and isotropy, which is when you break the inversion symmetry and the up and the down tetrahedra are different. So there's a paper by Nick Shannon and company which showed that the classically, the Coulomb spin liquid survives not only at the nearest neighbor point, but also away from it when you introduce breathing and isotropy. And indeed for a spin one half calculation, we do find that. We find that the bow ties and the pinch points remain intact. Uh, the width of the bow ties, uh, if you do a cut along this thing, uh, remains rather unchanged. And so the system is sort of, uh, is, is non-magnetic, not just as an isolated point, but in an extended region of parameter space involving breathing and isotropy. Uh, we could also, uh, you know, uh, sort of employing the flexibility of the FRG, do a calculation for the spin one nearest neighbor antiferromagnet. There have been very few investigations into this, but this has recently come into big limelight because of this recent nature physics paper by Bob Kawa where he synthesized the fluoride compound, NaCa and I2F7, which is a nickel two plus spin one compound. And the and they sort of, uh, the, the, there, was a, there was a few papers appearing on trying to explain the, the origin of the dynamical structure factor and the, and the approximate bow ties to see there. So what, sorry, uh, what we find here is that uh, also the spin one problem is magnetically disordered. So as you see that typically people, when they were looking for quantum spin liquids in the old days would focus on just 2D problems and with low spin values. And that was realized over time that it's a very pessimistic point of view. Uh, indeed, in 3D for spin one half, you already saw, and there are other papers that there's stronger evidence growing that the system is non-magnetic. Then even for spin one, uh, the pyrochlor lattice, uh, for, uh, as far as the RG is concerned, tries to give you a conclusion that the system is non-magnetic. So even when you increase the spatial dimensionality to 3D, and you increase the spin value to spin one, and both of these factors act against that, uh, one still uh, gets a quantum spin liquid behavior. What happens at large is, is something very tricky. Uh, we find that there is some appearance of a weak instability in the RG flow starting from spin three half onwards. But the trouble is that if you plot the susceptibility along a high symmetry path, there is no clear selection at any particular Q point down to very large values of spin. This is in line with, with what Chris Henley found that uh, it seems that the selection effects, uh, order by disorder selection effects are, are actually very weak. And it seems that, uh, that uh, even upon including inclusion of higher orders in 1 over S, which are already embedded in FRG, um, uh, the selection effects are so feeble that in one loop FRG, we are unable to capture this. So right now we are tackling this, uh, this approach to sort of gone up to three loop now and trying to see whether there is any sort of selection at a particular wave vector or not. But as of now, even in RG, the, the, the problem of the ground state at large S remains open, right? Uh, if you include J2, you get uh, another plethora of very complicated magnetic orders, uh, classically, which we also characterize. Some of it has been looked at in earlier papers. And the most important result we found was that uh, the, this non-magnetic phase for the nearest neighbor model extends and survives even into the inclusion of a finite J2 coupling. And this whole white region is, uh, is, is a region in which there is no dipolar long range order and possibly also no quadrupolar order, uh, as far as we could tell. And in spin one, this region gets shrunk, but it still remains appreciable and, and finite. And one of the open questions we left is that what is the precise microscopic nature of the quantum spin liquid or possibly VBC states that could be stabilized in this large. <clears throat> 
region. Uh, the structure factor changes completely. Uh, you know, the bow ties immediately disappear the moment you add finite neighbor long, sort of, sorry, uh, second neighbor couplings, but I will not go into the details. So this is the work I was telling. There's a recent spin liquid uh, candidate, which is a nickel two plus spin one. And this is the inelastic data of scattering. Uh, and uh, sort of, uh, we try to model it. Uh, and indeed, it turns out that uh, they also argue there could be a small ferromagnetic coupling which destroys the spectral weight at the pinch point. And you can reproduce it symmetrically. I wanted to describe another thing, but I was under the assumption it's a one hour talk. And I realized yesterday night, after looking at the schedule, that it's 35 minutes. So I'll have to skip this, but I'll be happy to discuss this collaboration we had with Bella Lakes Group on a hypercargome system, which is PB cute, we call it. It's a spin one half copper two plus system in which uh, sort of uh, we, uh, they did inelastic neutron scattering and we try to beautifully reproduce uh, the, the, the features and the structure factor uh, from an FRG calculation uh, in this thing. But I'll be happy to discuss this uh, agreement which turns out even quantitatively uh, very well uh, with this thing. And uh, yeah, so just for the conclusions, so the FRG allows you to investigate many types of two body spin interactions. Heisenberg, Zelishinsky, Maria, Kitaev, XXZ, long range, sort of. So it's a very flexible approach as far as, inter as studying these, uh, you know, two spin interaction Hamiltonians is concerned. You can do 2D and 3D lattices, and you can go up to very large system sizes, so you get some reliable estimates of the thermodynamic limit. Higher spins are possible. Uh, we are now also able to characterize uh, the nature of the low energy gauge theory, so you can combine this projective symmetry group classification of Ansaza. Uh, so you take the FRG, low energy vertex, and self-consistently solve the mean field equations and try to get some insights, whether it's a U1 spin liquid or Z2. Uh, dimerization and valence bond crystals can be investigated, not in an unbiased way, because of course we don't have access to the dimer-dimer correlation, which will require higher point vertices, but via response functions. Spin thematic states can be studied. Uh, I didn't discuss it, but that's part of our paper. Again, via response functions, you break symmetry in spin space. Uh, you can go to higher loops. Now we are trying to develop a multi-loop FRG, which would try to, you know, incorporate the, or implement the parquet approximation exactly. The trouble is that what we cannot do is coupling beyond two body interactions, right? Here, yeah. for example, we can't do biquadratic interactions because that would require four point vertices, which we cannot compute. Symmetric interactions are a bit difficult, but now also doable. Uh, there's no dynamic response yet, but we are working on, on implementing the Keldish formulation of RG. Uh, the, and hopefully then soon we will also have the dynamical structure factor. Uh, 1D systems are not accessible for an interesting but some reason about the imbalance of diagrams between the ladder and the RPA. You always get artificial results. And uh, that's all I, I have. This. Thank you for your attention and sorry for going over time. Okay, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the first test of the FRG was done on the J1, J2, spin one half. Yeah, we com cannot compute the, the staggered magnet, but what we can tell, of course, is we reproduce the standard thing about the, the so in 3D lattices, we can uh, uh, compute the transition temperature, like in the simple cubic. In the 2D, we get magnetic order as usual, but I cannot compute the, the sub-lattice magnetization. I don't have access to that quantity directly. No, so, so, so the fermion hopping terms are not allowed. The propagator is strictly local, and it remains so. So in the RG flow, you, dev, you, you generate dynamically the self-energy, but that's a purely imaginary term. So, uh, so this constraint is not violated. At low temperatures especially, because you don't allow fermion fluctuations, there is no hopping term in, you know, involved. Yeah, but you can... You, yeah, but you can then do the popo fedotov method and check. So the popo fedotov method would lead to a cancellation of the doubly occupied and the empty size, and that enforces the constraint. You just put an imaginary chemical potential, right? So in the, in the partition sum in the trace, you see that the popo fedotov method works by, by this cancellation of the double and the empty size. So that we checked, that you can do straightforwardly implement. And that's an exact. Then then. The propagator still remains exactly 1 over i omega. As I said, there is no 
fermion fluctuations are not allowed. Just so is, is, is it true that you will never, within this approach, you won't be able to capture effects which are more sensitive to whether spin is even or odd or half odd integer, those kind, because which are like, for example, spin what versus spin half on yeah. or, or in two dimensions also. Uh, yeah, but that would require, yeah, so that's a good question. I mean, uh, once we have access to the dynamics, right, the dynamical structure factor, if there are signatures in that, you know, uh, so how? But, but what I meant was, is it true that is this approach, in some sense, perturbative expansion in, in 1 over s in some sense, or, or not? Because those, uh, like, those factors could be non-perturbative. They are e to the power s. Right, right, right. I, so I, I would not say, I mean, the, the, the reason why I give you analogy with these diagrammatic was to get some sort of an intuitive picture, right. but it does not assume any mean field is starting point. As I said, I do, right. not, I do not start from it and then start doing fluctuations on top of it. Right? That, was, that was trying to sort of a very hand-waving way of telling you right. what roughly these diagrams sort of, you know, yeah. when you throw them off and yeah, would mean. Did you try something like, for, did you try studying, for example, model where you know they are Sorry, which, which? If, if you take a model which has emergent fermions, for example, honeycomb model of it, I have maybe further, you know, it's stable. Do these things come out right? That see that is the. So. Uh, that's where these fermions are kind of still. Right. I mean, I mean yeah. So, so, I mean, so, so, so systems, for example, so let me say, in the, say in the pyrochlor lattice, right? You have the large S limit. In the largest limit, you have a certain algebraic decay of spin-spin correlations and what Arnav described. All of that you reproduce exactly in FRG, separately in the largest limit, right? Now the question then arises is for models in which, for example, you need to characterize whether the dispersion is linear at low frequencies, you know, where you have U1 spin liquids or what kind of a dispersion it is. That becomes a little more tricky because then you need access also, you know, in order to have uh, the, to, to the full dynamical structure factor to characterize the nature of the low energy sort of, you know, excitations. That is something we are working on. So as of now, what I have is only the zero frequency part of the dynamical structure factor, right? So whatever information one can extract from that, of course, the full information is there on the Matsubara frequency axis. The problem is that this analytical continuation is not well controlled in most cases, except when the Pardee approximant was applicable. So that's only one case we could do. So, so as soon as we have access to that, then one can do a much more clear marking. Actually, maybe sort of following Tarun's question, uh, what if you just applied it to the Kitaev model? Yeah. You know there is a spin liquid, either 2D or 3D, you know, the 3D versions of it. Yeah, you get the spin liquid behavior, yeah. Like, how, how do you see that in your... Uh, yeah, so the tree, model? okay. So, uh, so in this thing, all you can tell as of now is that the system remains non-magnetic. Uh, then the second thing you can do is to characterize the nature of the low energy gauge theory. For that, you need to take the PSG classification of spin liquids that Xiaogang Wen that you, that you can do in the or you can do in the boson in the fermionic representation, and then take the FRG low energy vertex, put it in the Fock-like mean field equation, self-consistently solve it, and see that that particular answer generates the largest amplitude under the RG flow. That is how He's you would done do that it. for the Kitaev model. That has been done, yeah. Right, there's a pay, uh, that we did as a test. Yes, uh, there's a la, in, in, uh, in last year, the, today, early this year, there appeared a paper for that. We did a test for that thing. Uh, what you uh, uh, so uh, regarding? Uh, sorry, I was about to address one more point, but I forgot anyway. Yeah. So th there's a reformulation of RG uh, also in terms of Majorana fermions. Yeah, that gives you a direct indication. So that has also been done, yeah, well, beyond Spierski, now at Berkeley, I guess. So he was in Berlin with Johannes Reuter, he did that. So you can just reformulate the whole set of equations and, and then do that. that. That he told me gives you the direct indication. Okay, thank you. I think we'll move on to the coffee break. Uh, thanks, Yashir, again. Uh, you can continue.